Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3. If you'll go with me there. Proverbs 3. Principles. Principles to live by. Principles to live by. Last week I gave you just an, uh, uh, an introduction into principles to live by. We talked uh, very quick, uh, very quickly we got through it, but just really the introduction into what we would be starting off in tonight. Just a quick refresher. Um, uh, we'll read uh, Proverbs 3, Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 6. Heavenly Father, bless our time tonight. Uh, Lord, we live in a time where it's easy to grip on to anything that feels good or sounds good but has no um, rooted substance. Uh, but Lord, we know that uh, your, not only is your word substance, it is root. It is the root of substance. Uh, Lord, help us to um, uh, plant ourselves in your word, say like Joshua and like so many others, um, that uh, we'll take it and put it in our heart. We'll live by it. It won't depart out of our, our mouth, and uh, we'll just decide to live by it. Uh, Lord, help us to do that uh, more and more each day. Um, even I think some of the strongest Christians here may still have strongholds or um, uh, stumbling blocks in their way. And Lord, I'd ask that you'd help us to get the victory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine eyes, uh, or but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, I want the Lord to direct my paths, so that's what I've been trying to do. Uh, let the Lord uh, decide what I was trying to do. Um, I've, I, used, I, I did it because Brother Hiles did it. He used to say that he didn't he would even pray about what to wear on Sunday. So I, all right, I'm going to pray about what to wear on. Or not, I didn't fall down on my knees and go before the throne of grace and say, oh, dear God, what do I wear on Sunday? But it was more like a, um, Lord, what, you know, what should I wear on Sunday? And I guess you could call it peace about what to wear. So yesterday I picked out a shirt that I wanted to wear. It was the shirt that I wore yesterday that I have never, I was, I haven't been able to fit in this thing. I bought it brand new. Alex never wore it before. And uh, the buttons were like right here, trying to button that thing. I'm like, I'll never fit in that shirt. I'm going to give it away. Well, yesterday, just for kicks, I tried it on, and it fit. It buttoned. I'm like, what? I was so happy I was going to wear it two days in a row. Uh, I was like, yeah. And then I went to put it on this morning. Um, my, my midsection may have shrunk, but my neck didn't. And I went to button the top button and put my tie on and put, folks, if, 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 for you ladies, I don't know if you know or not, but if a top button on your, your button up shirt, your button down shirt, um, if the neck is already snug, go ahead and put a tie around that thing and then try to flip the collar down. You about choke yourself. It's nearly impossible. So I thought, ah, oh, man, I can't wear this shirt. And Jamie said, because you didn't pray about it. I was like, suck, I didn't knock you out. But um, uh, so I, I prayed about it, and um, I found the next best thing. Uh, but um, uh, I pray, I try to pray just about everything. I try to do uh, and not make a decision that I don't want the Lord to, to have me make. And um, uh, So I, I try to acknowledge the Lord in all my ways. But in the scripture, it gave us, it gave us um, uh, some principles. Uh, some principles. Verse one, he talks about um, my law and my commandments. These aren't the kings. He's talking about God's, the principles of God. Solomon's not saying um, uh, my commandments and my law. He's talking about uh, uh, the God's commandments, God's law. And uh, this is addressed to us. So in verse two, we find the result of obeying and keeping the law uh, and his commandments. What does it say? It says length of days, long life, peace shall they add to thee. Length of days meaning uh, you get a lot, a lot out of your days. And it also means that you get prolonged days, prolonged life. It says um, 
uh, uh, length of days and long life. Okay, it's, it's not redundant. It's not repeating itself. It's saying length of days. Brother Howes used to preach a message called how to get 25 hours out of a day. How to get 25 hours in a day. He talked about It was talking about productivity and schedule and making your day it's not about your days. It's about how you fill up those days. Well, this is, I believe, what he's talking about. Length of days. Length of days and long life. Getting a lot out of the day. You follow principles and you get results. You follow principles and you get results. Um, I, uh, I put a post a, a couple years ago um, about uh, what to be loyal to. Not who to be loyal to, but what to be loyal to. I said, uh, there's a great, there's all kinds of influences in this life, but be loyal to principle. Be loyal to principle. Who to be loyal to? Favorite team, uh, family, um, um, uh, best friend, um, people in your life or whatever the case may be. Who to be loyal to? I, I tell you right now, allegiances change. You can know somebody for 20, 25, 30 years, and people do it all the time. People are married for, for years and years and years and years, and they just get sick of each other one day and cancel it out. It's not about who to be loyal to. It's what to be loyal to. Now, it, it is a who because it's John 1.1, 1, 1. but it, it, the what is a who. It is God, and God is also the what. What? The book. And then the, if you're loyal to that book, it helps you to know who to be loyal to. Because if I'm loyal to that book and you are loyal to that book, then we are loyal to each other. But when you are no longer loyal to that book or I am no longer loyal to that book, you no longer owe loyalty to me if I am in violation of that book. You know, it's not, and I don't mean you, you don't show up at the hospital. I don't mean that you don't stop on the side of the road and help change a tire. I'm not saying that you don't, I'm not saying you're not friendly and kind and courteous. I'm not saying that. I'm saying is if I, if I am living in contrast to God's word and my life has such an influence in your life that you choose me over God. You get what I'm saying? Everybody understand? It's, it's God first, his book first. So you choose loyalty to principle, the principle of God's words. And God says, um, uh, uh, or his book is, is the principle, and when you're loyal to the principle, you get results. You get results. All right, very quickly. Two principles are found in verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Uh, uh, these are Bible principles. The Bible says, buy truth and sell it not. Buy truth and and sell it not. In verse number four, it continues, uh, and we see the results of living by principles of the word of God. What does it say? If you buy truth and sell it not, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Now, I like that. I like that phrase. I like to think that I find good standing, good standing with God and man. It says, in the sight of God and man. The Bible uh, says in verse number five, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. I, and I, I just take that to mean don't follow the social norms. Don't follow the social norms. Well, the world's doing it. All right, well, that's reason for me not to be doing it. Well, the world's using this type of slang. All right, well, that's reason for me not to be doing it. Listen, uh, uh, if the Lord tarries and the church grows and the academy grows, um, uh, uh, slang is not, the, the worldly vernacular is not allowed in it. I'm not saying you got to talk like the king of England from 1611. I'm not walking you, uh, how art thou today, my brethren? You don't, and I'm not saying that. But using these new, dumbed down, retarded words, these new hip hop, rock music, um, uh, um, uh, it's, it's a prostitution of the English language. It's what it is, and we're not doing it. I won't get up here and poke fun of it. I won't use it. You don't use it, and we'll all get along. Um, uh, uh, but following the social norms, well, this is what they're wearing. Uh, men didn't used to wear skinny jeans, and now they did, and now they're not. And now they're, all men didn't walk around with beards, and then a bunch of them did, and, and man bun ponytails, and all these. It's the social norm. Everybody, no. Uh, those hats, Dad, we got at um, Men's Warehouse. And you throw it on, and... I was wearing one on a Saturday, went out sewing, and there's a fella getting out, uh, older, uh, uh, older gentleman getting out of his car, and he was wearing one. And I said, and I was wearing mine. 
And I said, man, I like your hat. And he looked around me. He's like, I like your hat. And he said, we got to be trendsetters. We got to be trendsetters. Um, Solomon said that there's nothing new under the sun. Those hats used to be what was in. Those used to be the thing. And then they kind of faded out and they came back in. And, and by the way, um, I, I might need you to go to that blue jacket place at North Christ Shopping. There's one on, uh, right there. On a, and they were closed when we got there yesterday. If, it's, if you think it's me, I need you to snag it for me and I'll repay you. <laughs> I saw us in there. I'm like, oh, we got to get in there, you know, open up. Um, but I don't want to follow the way of the world. I don't want to do what the world is doing. And, and um, uh, everybody follow um, cryptocurrency and hop on the bandwagon and everybody do this and everybody do that. I'm not saying be, be rebellious if something is um, the right thing to do just because the world is doing it. Don't, don't not do it if it's the right thing for you to do. But if the world, the social norms, this is what I think he's saying. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. Don't follow the social norms. Don't follow what seems right. Follow what is right. Don't follow what feels right. Follow what is right. Follow right. Always do right. Don't follow what, um, uh, what they say everybody is doing. Uh, I don't know who coined it, but I've seen it over the last few years attached to political references. Um, right is right, even if no one is doing it. And wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it. Don't just do what feels right or what you think is right. Unless you found it and you have confidence in a multitude of counselors and through uh, much prayer. Much prayer. Uh, uh, speaking of um, uh, proceeding forward, I, I taught about out of the book of Nehemiah about how he prayed carefully. And after he had prayed carefully, he proceed, after he knew he had his answer, he proceeded confidently. So pray carefully. Pray care. And that prayer is this right here. Just, okay. All right, that's a good step to take. And then you just, okay, I can. Like having that stick where you're poking around going, okay, I can stay there. I can walk there. That is sure footing right there. Um, and we've all done that. Winter time is coming up where you have to be careful of your step, careful of where you're stepping going, okay, all right, that's safe. And sometimes that's what prayer and decision is, is you're taking your time going through it. But once you have the answer, proceed confidently. Proceed knowing that God opened the door to it. Um, the last, uh, I, this last decision where we, our, our, our whole family was at a turn, not a turning point, but a, a, um, um, uh, a climax point where we had decisions to make and things to do, where it all had come to a head. And, and I said, okay, God, I, I need to know if this is it. And then all of a sudden, I, so here I was getting in the valley of decision, getting ready to make a decision, and in came a, um, a bogey, uh, an anomaly came into the screen, and I said, oh, Okay, Lord, is that you? Is that what you want me to do? I said, Lord, if that's not you, I need you to slam that door. And that door said, slam. And I said, okay. Now I know without a shadow of a doubt, this is where God wants me. This is the decision he had me made, make, and, and I'm going to do it. I don't understand it all. It's not the ideal situation, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it and watch God. Um, I'm going to allow God to write the story of Jake Jackson. Jake Jackson's just going to, be the subject of what he's writing, amen, because it's all for the glory of God. Um, the Bible says trust in the Lord, so don't follow social norms, don't follow what seems right, follow what is right. Verse number six says, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. There's the result again. There's a result, an action and a result, a principle and a result. In all thy ways acknowledge him, that's a principle. I mean, that's a principle to live by. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And he'll direct your paths. But if you don't acknowledge him, you'll direct your paths. You will. Um, I, I'm so glad I live in an age uh, of technology. I like technology. I think it's neat. It's intriguing. It's cool. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I... I haul sometimes what you call an oversized load, and an oversized load has all these restrictions because uh, the FMCSA and the DOT and uh, the IRS, they, they know where all the um, major construction zones are going, the width of those construction zones, height of bridges, all kinds of stuff, and then you type in your data into their, their, their server, their, their, uh, not their server, but their uh, 
website and tell them, hey, this is our truck, this is how big, how heavy, how wide, and they'll tell you, hey, this is the route that you have to take. And then they print out all your permits. It's $20 to cross into this state and 15 into this state and 10 into this state with an oversized load. So they print out uh, uh, your permits for you and on the permit have the directions or the roads that you are allowed to travel in that state from where you're from where you're starting to where you're going. It says, okay, as long as you're if you follow this these roads, you'll end up at the destination you're legally allowed to travel with this size load. But sometimes the 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 uh no, nah, not sometimes. All of the times their their directions are very vague. They're vague. They say follow um uh let's see what was it? I can't remember what loop it was uh, going around uh, St. Louis. What the loop, I can't remember. But one of them was north and one of them was south. And I was on it, but it didn't say which, which, which north or south to take. So I took south because I knew in my head I'm headed southwest of St. Louis. Why in the world would I go north? So I took south. And I had an oversized load. And it took me like... As close to downtown St. Louis as I've ever been. I was hogging up three lanes. These embankments. <laughs> and I had this big old giant building on the back of my truck, and I'm hogging up three lanes. And I thought, this cannot be right. There is no way this is right. Why did that happen? Because I was left to making my own decision because I did not have clear direction. And I ended up slowing down traffic and gripping the steering wheel a little fat and uh, being nervous and being afraid that I was going to get pulled over by DOT. <laughs> you know, what are you doing down here? Well, I, here are the directions. Well, you were supposed to take north. Well, that's stupid. Uh, I'm going south. <laughs> um, uh, and look, and that's, you know, that's the way of the Lord sometimes. The way of the Lord has you going north when you think you should be heading south. But I'll tell you what, if you'll acknowledge the Lord in all your ways, he will direct your paths. He will direct your paths. Because I'm, I, I was lucky that there wasn't any major construction going on that I couldn't get through. You know, I want to, the DOT for his, his, and, and, and uh, all these people who've never driven a truck before or been inside of a semi or operated one of those things want to make all the laws for them. I'm not here to complain about that. But what I am saying is I am thankful because I, my, the, the load that I was taking down south uh, uh, was, um, was about 12 feet wide, near, near 12 feet wide. And they're doing construction down on 69 South where if, if, if you're over 8 feet 11, you can't make it through. And if they hadn't given me the directions to go around that, catastrophe would have happened. So I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for directions. And a lot of people, they don't know it, but they're headed for a, 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 a 10 foot wide opening and they got a 12 foot problem and they're gonna do it all by themselves and not have clarity from the Lord and end up in destruction. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Last week I gave you number one, God's law, God's laws never conflict with each other. God's laws never conflict with each other. Number two, I gave you all of God's commands are possible to obey. All of the ones that you and I are supposed to and required to obey are possible to obey. God has not given us anything that we could not do. He would not have told us to do anything we could not do. All of God's commands are possible to obey. Number three, God's laws are not agreements. They are commands. God and I don't always agree, amen? What was that sermon? God and I don't always agree. Brother Howes preached one, um, how to argue with God and win. <laughs> That's one I got I to gotta figure out because uh, I want God to see it my way, you know? Uh, uh, God and I don't always agree, but it, it, it doesn't matter if you don't agree or not. God didn't write some agreement with me on his commands. He's commanded me to do it, whether I like it or not, whether I'm comfortable or not, whether I get the big picture or not, they are commands. Number one, God's laws never conflict with each other. Number two, all of God's commands are possible to obey. Number three, God's laws are not agreements, they are commandments. Number four, all of God's principles go hand in hand supporting each other. All of God's principles go hand in hand supporting each other. 
Uh, they, they build each other up. They build each other up. Um, now, I, 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 said, I said these two things uh, and, uh, uh, as a reminder, and I want to hop into the principles for tonight, the principles for tonight. Um, number one thing I said is our, our biggest problem in life is we waste too much time. We waste too much time. Uh, it's not that we don't have enough time, it's that we waste time. So it doesn't, uh, the second thing I said is it doesn't take a lot of time to be a good Christian. It doesn't take a lot of time, it takes your whole life. You see, good Christianity isn't I have arrived, it's I am still arriving. I, it's, um, we watched a movie when we were kids, uh, it was called Iron Will. Anybody ever seen Iron Will? Okay, if you haven't seen Iron Will, you need to watch Iron Will. Uh, uh, and that's all I'll say. That pastor's, he's, he's promoting movies. Some movies, yes, some movies that stir the heart. Back when movie producers thought about what stirred the American. Uh, but anyway, uh, Iron Will. And what he was, it was a, a, sled, a, sled re, a sleigh race with Santa Claus. It was a, a dog sled race um, through uh, Canada to what, Minneapolis or something? Manitoba to Man Minneapolis. What'd they have, though? Was it just one straight shot? No, there were stops to refuel, replenish, warm up, to get food and relax a little bit and to maybe get the health care they needed and bandage up and feed the dogs. There were stopping points to an eventual destination. Well, Christian, heaven's the eventual destination. Uh, I was talking to my Uncle Andy last night, and I, and I, and I quoted off a, a poem to him. Um, I think it was Edgar Allan Poe who said, um, um, uh, oh, what is it? And the grave is not its goal. Tell me not in mournful numbers. Who was it? Life is but an empty dream. The grave is not its goal. The grave is not its goal, folks. I'm not living this life to go live it while, and see, that's a, a big problem with the world is they think live it up, live it up, live it up, live it up because they think the grave is where they're going to end up. But it's a whole lot worse than that or it's a whole lot better than that. So the grave is not its goal. I don't plan, I, I'm not going to the grave. I'm going to heaven. So I know that I'm not going to fall. I, I know that the race is li it, it lies before me. I know that I can run it, uh, and, and I'm, not, uh, I'm not in it to get first place. I'm in it to first place for me. Finishing is my first place, amen? I just want to finish. So heaven is where my goal is, and every day I'm at a new stopping point. That's Christianity, or a new beginning point. That's Christianity. Christian and there are um, um, momentous occasions. 50 years of children's church ministries. Isn't that incredible? Amen. 50 years, that is a momentous stopping point. Uh, 40 years of marriage, that's an incredible, uh, momentous uh, um, um, uh, a point of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus. Uh, 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 of emphasis. Uh, uh, that's a, that's a, uh, uh, these, we, so we have these pinnacle moments. Um, uh, this year, this next coming year is... Um, uh, the 29th year, so 2024, will be 30 years that Three Rivers Baptist Church has been in Fort Wayne. That's, wow, man, wow, 30 years, three decades, that's a great, uh, okay, so Jamie and I, 15 years of marriage this coming, this next May. Man, that's 15 years, that's incredible, that's, um, uh, uh, okay, so you get the point. These great points. But Christianity isn't, I have arrived. It will be one day. But Christianity, as long as we run this race, is I, I'm just arriving every day. I arrive, show up every day. Show, just like you show up to work, show up to, to run the Christian life. Show up to run, and listen, anybody ever called off of work because you were too sick? Anybody ever call off their Christianity for the day because you just, yes, you have. Yes, you have. Whether it was you just laid in bed and moped or you were mad, or you held on to that grudge that day, or you just had a bad day, you just said, Jesus, I'm calling in today. <laughs> you know, he said, all right, come back tomorrow. Make sure you're in your place tomorrow. Be where you're supposed to be an hour from now. But just as soon as you get over your little temper tantrum, just you be back where you're supposed to be, back where you're supposed to be, and do it, what you're supposed to be doing. So it doesn't take a lot of time to be a good Christian. It takes your whole life. It takes your whole life. Um, uh, and that's not um, a, a mountain to stare up and go, I'll never, I'll never scale that mountain. No, it's a, 
Oh, so there's no hurry then. There's no hurry. I, I get in a hurry. I listened to, man, I listened to Brother Howes this week and Brother Bob Gray and, and some of these other fellows, and I thought, man, I want to be like that kind of, I want to be a preacher like that. I want to preach with that kind of conviction, that kind of power, that kind of empathy, that kind of passion. I want to preach like that. Okay, but it, it did take them a lot of time to get there. But they've committed their works unto the Lord and their thoughts were established because they've committed their lifetime uh, uh, um, uh, work ethic to being to that. They grew into that. Well, I hoped one day to grow into that. I don't want to, uh, I mean, I don't want to quit the race halfway through. I don't want to quit halfway through. I don't want to get three quarters of the way through and be like, ah, it's not turning out the way I want to and I'm just going to cut bait. No, stick it out your whole life. It's no hurry. Let, the, let, God, let God use you to grow in grace. Very quickly, I want to give you a couple things tonight. Principles for your walk with God. Principles for your walk with God. And you can't have a walk with God if you don't have these principles. You can think you do. You can pretend that you do, but you don't have a walk with God if you don't have these principles. Number one, the Bible says in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be open unto you. First Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Hebrews eleven six says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. And uh, that he is uh, also the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So what is the principle? Christians are supposed to pray. That's the principle. The principle is pray. Christians are supposed to pray. Um, uh, so in talking about our walk with God, what does God ask of me? What is God asking of me? Um, uh, these are, and by the way, these aren't in like, do this one up first and this one. Second. There's, there's no precise formula here necessarily. Um, but here's a, here's a list of a couple things that God wants us to do. Some principles that we need to have. Um, uh, uh, prayer. Prayer. Christians are supposed to pray. Prayer shows faith in him. You know, prayer shows faith in him. Prayer show, and God says uh, 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 it's impossible to please me without faith, right? Well, what is the best way that we show faith in the Lord? One of the best ways that we can do that is through prayer. Through prayer, showing faith in God through prayer. You see, we, we say that we have faith in God because we trust him. But do you trust his promises enough to pray? Do, uh, and you say, well, I don't feel like I'm effective in prayer. I don't feel like uh, 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 he, he, he really hears me. Now, folks, you, you ought to have a prayer life. You ought to have a prayer life. I'm not talking about um, uh, waiting till the emergency room. I'm not talking about waiting till you're behind bars. I'm not, waiting, uh, I'm not talking about uh, uh, waiting till a, a dire moment in life. I'm talking about a prayer life. I'm talking about a prayer life when you're on top of the mountain. When you're on top of the mountain. Folks, if you can have an on top of the mountain, life is good, real solid prayer life then you definitely have one in the valley because it's the things in the valley that push us to having a prayer life. It's easy not to pray when you're on the mountaintop because your bills are play, paid and you're healthy and everybody's happy and your needs are met and you're comfortable and the, the, the heat is on in the winter and the AC is on in the summer and uh, the lights are on and the water runs and I have different, I've got a brown jacket and a blue jacket and I got different colored suits and um, uh, I, I can see you know, my, my vision's 2025, amen, hallelujah for that. I've got a 2025 vision, and uh, 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 overall, I'm healthy, and I feel good, and it's easy, to, it's easy not to pray. It's easy to get lazy, right, when things are good. I've heard a coach say, he said, um, uh, uh, talking about players, he said, I've got two different players that come to practice. I have the players who, who solely run on talent, and players who solely run on work ethic. He said, but the, but the player that has the work ethic can develop a talent. But a player who has the talent and no work ethic. He said, it's hard to teach work ethic, but you can teach talent. Because talent is developed over doing something over and over and over and over and over again.
over and over and over again. Well, we liken that, I liken that to a a mountaintop talent, mountaintop uh, uh, Christianity, where it's easy not to pray. But if you can pray, if you can earnestly have a prayer life, when you're comfortable, when you're content, when life is good, then I promise you, I I, I, I promise you it's easier. It, it, It comes more naturally to have a prayer life in the valley because hard times push us to prayer. Or they, they're supposed to, they're designed to push us to prayer. A lot of Christians, they, they, run from, they run from it because they've never really established a prayer life to begin with. Uh, uh, if you have a prayer life on top of the mountains, you can, one, you can have one. You will have one in the valley if, as long as you don't let it uh, make you bitter. Now, you don't have to um, uh, uh, run from God in shame and, and you don't have to go to God in shame. And say, hey, God, it's me. Do you remember my name? Hey, God, it's me. And and I know I only do this once a year. Or I only come to you when when things are bad. uh, Or or maybe I just came to you the last time I was in a valley. You don't have to go to to God in shame. It says that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Now, uh, uh, I'm telling you tonight that you may have an emergency. um, And you don't have time to get right with God. Well, use the emergency to get right with God. Use the jail time to get right with God. Use the, the, uh, the dire moment to get right with God. Use the valley to get right with God. Don't let it keep you away from God and say, well, I'm, a, I'm in the emergency room. I'm in the jail. Uh, something bad has happened in my life, and I'm, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I have too much self-respect. I have too much um, uh, integrity to, to, to go before God now. If I didn't ask God, if I wasn't praying to God in the good times, I'm not praying to God in the bad times because I don't deserve him. Okay, that's, that's wrong thinking. It sounds about right, because that's human thinking. That's, we abandoned God in the good times, we forgot about God when we had it all, and now that we don't have it all, we want to go to the one who has it all and ask for some of it. God wants us to come to him, good times or bad. Emergency room, jailhouse, no matter what it is, God wants us to come to him. He's there, he's with you. He said, I'd never leave you nor forsake you. So I'm telling you, Christian, you ought to have a prayer life. Whether it starts in the emergency room or it starts on the mountaintop, you ought to have a prayer life. You ought to have a prayer life um, uh, for your spouse and for your children. Um, uh, name your kids. Name your spouse. Name your loved ones and pray for them according to what they need. Pray for them and say, dear God, you know them. You know their heart. You know what they need. Lord, I'd ask that you'd help me to be able to provide those things and um, uh, uh, Lord, help my family, help my wife and help my kids, help my unsaved family, help my unsaved friends to get saved. We ought to pray for our family. We ought to pray for our friends. We ought to pray for all the folks that we have on our hearts by name. Now, here's a problem with Christians. It's, it's a problem with Christians, and, and I've done it, and, and uh, you've done it. And, but what we end up doing is, is we say we believe in prayer, um, uh, but we're, we actually are atheists when it comes to the action. We, we uh, sure, we, we say we believe in it because it's, you know, the right thing. It, it, it makes us, you know, look and sound like we're Christian. But when it comes to prayer itself, we, we don't really do it or we don't really believe in it. Or at least you believe in it, but you believe in it for others. You don't believe that it'll work for you. You don't believe that your prayer matters. You think, um, uh, God's not really hearing me anyway. My prayer alone doesn't make a difference. Um, uh, and I'll tell you this tonight. If, if you can't think of the last time you had a, a, an answer to prayer, you need to write down a prayer list. You need to start remembering things. You need to start saying, when's the last time? I don't care if you go back. I, no, I don't care if you go back five years, 10 years or longer and say, this is the last time I know without a shadow of a doubt, I prayed earnestly, I prayed hard, I prayed to the, to the point of sweat and tears and blood where I begged God and God answered. All right, we'll go back that far if you have to. and Start getting those answers again. Start getting answers to prayer again. You can't tell me that prayer doesn't, or that prayer doesn't work because I've seen it work. It's worked for me. People, and listen, I, I, the thinking has come to my mind, but that God won't answer my prayers. I'm not John R. Rice. I'm not Tom Malone. I'm not Jack Hiles. I'm not um, uh, Jeff Fugate. I'm not George Bell. I'm not Robin Smith. I'm not Doug Jackson. I'm not, I'm not uh, George, uh, George uh, oh no, John Wilkerson. 
I'm not these pastors who can, I'm not Billy Sunday. I can't pray down, I can't t- pray down the power from heaven. I can't do those things. God's not going to hear me. So I'm, I'll just be that, I'll be the, I'll be, sure, I'm a pastor in the room because the Lord called me, but I'm that little pastor that God's not really paying any attention to because we don't run a big church and we don't have all those bus routes and we don't have the big work that, no, that is the thinking that the devil lays on you, that you're just an insignificant mom that you're just an insignificant father, that you're just an insignificant kid, that you're an insignificant church member, that what you do doesn't really matter, it doesn't have a part in the in the big picture. You know, you sure you're on the team, but you're at the end of the bench. When the subs get to play the last 16 seconds of the game, you're not even one that gets to go into play. You're like, you just be happy that you're wearing the uniform. That's the way the devil wants you to think. And that's not the way God wants you to think. That's a spirit of fear. That's a spirit that um, uh, of, of God cares about others, but he doesn't care about me. God wants us to pray. God wants us to pray. Uh, uh, what prayers has God answered for me? What prayers has God answered for you? Think about them. Record them. George Mueller wrote down over 50,000. It's said that he wrote over 50 thousand answers to prayer request he penned over one it said it said that it's recorded that he penned over one million words explaining those 50,000 answers to prayer now I don't know what the division is what's a million divided by 50,000 20 so 20 answers oh well that makes sense um 20 20 words per request huh or answer huh he kept it short Right, yeah, five and a million is 20. Yeah, I'd, but I, I figured I'd just go right to you because you're the human calculator. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. That's what, but 50,000 answers to prayer? He had, he had to be fudging some stuff. <laughs> God doesn't answer that many requests. I don't care who you are. No. Uh, George Mueller, he wrote a, he, he wrote a book. Um, uh, on um, how to get God to answer your prayers, what to do, what formulas and, and the attitudes to have about God get, about uh, God answering our prayers. Number one, God, uh, 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 it's required for Christians to pray. Number two, we're supposed to read the Bible. We're supposed to read the Bible. Uh, what, a, what a difficult task it is. A uh, military um, uh, sergeant, a drill instructor, walks into a room and you're supposed to have your weapons clean and and uh, your boots shine, so to speak, and your bed made, and, and, and uh, uh, you're supposed to know your weapon inside out and upside down and front to back and all those things like that. And um, he got one guy, a goober kind of guy, a Jerry Lewis kind of guy. And honestly, and, and I know I'm adding some humor to this, but that's what a lot of Christians are. We don't take it for real. We want to be there. Or we, we, we there are, we're genuinely, or, or we are um, genuinely there, but we, we don't really put our heart and soul into it, and we cannot even identify the weapon that we carry. If I said, what was the sword of the Spirit? Most, and I know some of you, you're here on Sunday night, you're matured Christians. Most of you would be, be able to uh, uh, raise your hand and identify in the book of Ephesians what the sword of the Spirit is. It is the Word of God. What is the shield? It's the shield of faith. What is the helmet? It's the helmet of salvation, but most Christians across churches across this country can't identify things in the Bible, can't identify people in the Bible. They don't know basic stuff in the Bible. It'd be like me getting all the way through high school and getting ready to, to, to graduate, and they ask me, you know, what's what's two plus two, and I can't, uh, uh, I don't know. Basic Christianity, and a whole lot of Christians don't know it simply because they don't read their Bible. If it's not moving on a screen, if it's not flashing and changing colors, in this world, it's, it's hard to get people to open up a book. It is difficult to get people, oh, books are antiquated. We can put that on our Kindle now. We can put that on our iPad now. We can put that on our tablet. Why can't we get screens up and put the scripture up on verses? It, don't you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, um, um, uh, it, it's a little bit of a hassle to carry my Bible, you know, to grab the Bible. And to, it's a hassle to bring your Bible to church. Oh, we're far past that now. It's, it's t- far too much of a hassle to bring myself to church because I can turn you on on my phone and my computer and my TV screen, let alone open up a book. 
But Christians are supposed to read the word of God. And I know, I know, there are people out there who be like, oh, so you think the word of God is only contained to, to ink and paper? Slap, stupid. If that's what you think I'm saying, then you're an idiot. Uh, but open up your Bible. Open up your Bible. Open up your Bible. If all, it, Listen, I get it. I've had people tell me, man, I have terrible eyesight and I need the lighting and I need, okay, all right, fine. I'm not throwing you under the bus. I'm not beating you over the head because you were one of the faithful ones that carried your Bible before you, for, to church all the time before you got cataracts. I get that. We're on the same page. It's all cool, copacetic. But my point is, is this generation my generation and the folks that are just a few years my elder and, 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 and anybody that's younger than me, they don't pick up books. It's rare that people pick up books and read the word of God. Oh, I read all the time. Oh, yeah? How much of the word of God do you read? I have family members who are avid readers. Well, how much of the Bible are they reading? I have friends who are avid readers. Man, they love books. Okay, great. Books, 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 pages. That's great. The smell of a book, that's wonderful. But if you can open up all the books in the world and read them, I'm not giving you props unless you open up the Word of God. The Word of God is the only book that is worthwhile reading. All other books matter. But they come second place to that book. Don't open up another book until you open up this book. Folks, how can we obey a God and his laws and understand law and grace, Mr. Law and Mr. Grace, how can we understand a book and obey a book we haven't even read? How can we, how can we uh, say that uh, we go out to give the gospel when we read so much of the book that it's written in and we know so little about it? According to the Bible, I am to study, I am to memorize, I am to meditate on the word of God. I am to study, I am to memorize, I am to meditate on the word of God. The Bible calls it my daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread, daily bread. It doesn't just say bread. He says daily bread, daily bread. Number one, Christians are supposed to pray. Number two, Christians are supposed to read the word of God. Number three, uh, uh, every Christian ought to be a member of a local church. Amen. There are some um, uh, fringe members that I would like to wrap my arms around their shoulder and say, hey, where are you on Sundays? Mom. Well, I, I, I went to visit this church this Sunday and I went to visit that church that Sunday and that's a church hopper. Don't be a church hopper. If you're a church hopper, please don't hop into this one. Um, but every Christian ought to be a church, uh, a member of a local church. The word of God says, and be ye planted, and be ye planted, be ye planted, not rooted up and then go uh, uh, sit somewhere else and then get up and go sit somewhere and then get up and root somewhere else. No, be planted somewhere. The local church is God's program for every single Christian. It's God's program for every Christian, every family, every child, man, and woman. Folks, we serve God through the local church. Well, I, I just like to go around blessing other churches. Let me tell you something, brother. You are not a blessing. Well, I put my tithe in there, and I, and I, 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 you know, I put myself out there to place. And I'm not saying that you have a ministry. There's families in this country who have special music ministries where they go around to church. I, I get that, but I'm talking about these folks who use um, uh, cloak and dagger, smoke and mirrors type of stuff because they're non-committed to planting themselves in a local New Testament church and getting planted somewhere and rooting in and, 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 and digging in their heels and saying, okay, this is my workshop and this is my ministry and this is where I will build my, my testimony for the Lord. Until God moves me. But that's what a lot of people do is they just, well, I'm going to go bless these people this week. And I'm going to go be a blessing to this church this week. And you ever hear anybody talk that way? Get away. Get away. Unless they're going to be a blessing to our church and bring in a big old fat check. Then, um, then we'll let them be a blessing. <laughs> then we'll let them be a blessing. But these, I'm talking church hopper. Folks, don't be a church hopper and stay away from church hoppers. Stay, and I'm not talking about backslidden folks, church hoppers, people who refuse to be planted. They're in and they're out and they're in and they're out and they're in and they're out and they're in and they're out. You get planted. 
You get planted, and don't you be an in and out Christian, a, a hop along Christian. The Bible says um, uh, that uh, uh, in Acts two forty one and forty seven, it says uh, uh, they got saved and were added, added to the church. It's really difficult for us to keep a ledger on church membership when we got folks who come in and say they're added, and then the next week they're subtracted for the next eight weeks. And then they show up and say they're a part of the, are you a member? Yeah, I'm a member. And then they subtract themselves for four weeks. And then they come, it's, like, it's, it's incredibly difficult to keep a ledger, a church roll. It'd be difficult for Three Rivers to say, when the roll is called, up. well, who's on the roll? Well, I'm a part of Three Rivers. Really, where are, where, where's, where are you? You aren't here. Your tithe isn't here. Your attention's not here. You show up for the harvest party and for candy, but you don't show up to pat a kid on the head and to work in the nursery and to put on a burgundy jacket and do ushering or push a vacuum or wash windows or sing in the choir or teach a class or tithe, amen, or work on a bus route. You don't show up to do any of those things, but you're a church member when the harvest party comes rolling around. You're a church member when the Easter comes rolling around and the Easter egg hunt, and you're a church member when the world's largest banana splits put on, on display. That's when you're a church member. No, you're a visitor, and you need to fill out a visitor's card every time you show up. I'll call names. Give me a few years. When I get surly like my father, I'll start calling names. Amen. <laughs> but it, it's, it, it's, it's laughable. No, no, it, it's, it's tear jerking is what it is because it's hurting the local New Testament church. That church just isn't what it used to be because you ain't what you used to be. They got added to the church. Added to what? The membership of the church. The membership of the church. They got saved, they got baptized, they were added to the church. Every Christian ought to be a member of their local church. Uh, and, and in this day and age, you have several local churches. We have several churches, or a few churches in close proximity to our church. But if God led you to this church, then stay in this church until God moves you. And I don't mean until your feelings move you or until what seems right moves you. I mean stay in it until God moves you so you can have peace and blessing in the moving. Don't move. It's better to stay planted where God had you and carry a burden and, and be sorrowful in God's will than it is to carry a burden and be sorrowful and second guess yourself and, and, and have a, um, a, 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 um, a broken conscience or a, um, a fractured conscience on your pillow when you lay down every night and go, man, did I make the right decision? Did I make the right decision? Did I make the right decision? It's better to do something that's hard to do and know that God is behind it because you can have peace about it than it is to just, well, I think I made the right decision. No, know that you made the right decision. Know that you did. Um, every Christian ought to be a, a member of their church, uh, of a local church. Number four, number four, we ought to be faithful in our attendance to that church. Well, I'm a member. Okay, good. Are you faithful to it? Are you faithful to it? The purpose of church is not just to um, uh, come to church to see what you can get out of it unless it's a truth that you need, unless it's some uh, conviction you're looking for. But a lot of folks are just looking for a people to be a part of. They're looking for a group to associate with. They're looking for uh, a connection. Um, but the purpose of church is not just uh, to get what I can get, but it's also to encourage others. If everybody would hear, would come in on Sunday looking to encourage another person, looking to help another person, instead of looking to be helped, uh, you would find the help. You would find the help. You find the help you need by helping others because the Lord makes sure that you get the help you need when you're looking to help others. Folks, it's always encouraging. I, I love going to church on a Wednesday. Um, um, I like uh, uh, going to church on Sunday. I like um, uh, seeing, I love it when people are here. Um, I will never complain about the attendance in church again because I preached to a really tough crowd before during COVID, Lucas and, and Dan. I didn't get any amens. The tithe was low. Uh, you know, <laughs> the spirit was low. The singing was off key. Uh, <laughs> I'll never complain about church attendance again after going through COVID and, and folks being scared out of their minds. And, and by the way, I will always say that um, uh, we left the church doors open. I said, 
You want to stay home, you stay home. But if you want to come to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night or Wednesday, the doors are open. If the doors are open, you come to church, we're having church. Um, uh, and I appreciate the folks that came through that. And um, sometimes you felt, well, I, I kind of feel sick. So I'm going to say, I, I get that. But we, we powered through it. I like coming to church and seeing it filled up. I like seeing buses filled up. I like seeing uh, uh, Sunday school classes filled up. And you may say, well, I don't feel like going. Now, you ought to go. You ought to go. Folks, you say, well, I don't feel like going. Go for someone else then. And I don't say go in place of someone. I say go so you can be a help or an encouragement to someone that's there. Go for someone else. So-and-so needs me. You know who needs you every single service? Your pastor. Your pastor needs to see you. You encourage your pastor by showing up. You encourage me by showing up. You don't know this, but somebody else is always looking for you when you're not here. They like seeing you here. They enjoy that you're here. Show up, show up, show up. Hebrews 10, it says, uh, uh, it tells us to be faithful. We ought not just to go to church. We ought to be involved in the work of the church. Be involved in its work. Be involved with what's going on it. And as long as you're faithful to it, you'll end up being involved with it. You're faithful to it. You're like, well, I want to stick around and see what happens. And you end up being a part of what happens. Don't, don't, don't um, uh, neglect the, first, the, the gathering of ourselves together. Lastly, number five, principles that we need, principles that we need in our walk for God. Number five, we ought to be witnesses for Christ. These are all very, all very basic tonight, amen? All, I mean, these were fastballs right down the middle. Each one and every single one of us should have been able to knock these out of the park. Uh, but we ought to be witnesses for Christ. Witnesses, these basics. Let's get back to the basics. We ought to tell people about Jesus. We ought to tell people about Jesus, what he has done, what he has done for us. Now, if you'll have a prayer life, if you'll read your Bible, if you'll be faithful to church, you'll eventually tell others about Jesus. There's no way, folks, I, I just don't know that that's possible, that you can have a real prayer life, a real prayer life. Not a complaining life, but a prayer life. Really read your Bible and search the scriptures. Say, God, speak to me. Be faithful to church. Be faithful to church and be planted in that church and not your whole life tell others about Jesus. You may be cold, you may be in a rut, you may be off track at the moment, but I'll tell you right now, if you'll keep praying, if you'll keep reading your Bible, if you'll still faithful to church, if you'll be faithful to a program, you'll get involved in a ministry, you will, you'll want to tell people about Jesus. You'll want to, and you will. And those are basic principles. Principles that every single Christian should have right there in their tool belt. I mean, there's some basic things that you need in a tool belt. Some basic tools. A tool starter kit, you know? A hammer, screwdriver. Obviously, both different. They, some folks call them a flathead. It's a, a flathead and a Phillips. Some people call it a star bit screwdriver. That's too many words. It's Phillips. Give me a, a star bit. What are you? That's a totally different bit. What are you talking about? Uh, 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 but um, uh, what else do you need? A saw, a, a, a razor knife. What, what are some other? A, a tape measure, pliers, a wrench, pipe wrench. You need what? Need those pliers. Nine millimeter. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, good luck. You buy it, it disappears. Um, it's just some basic stuff. Some, maybe some house goods. You need a broom. You need a refrigerator. You need a vacuum. I mean, I, I know it depends on where you live. But some essential things for your house. Folks, these principles tonight were the, uh, the essentials. These were spiritual housewarming gifts that you need principles. Folks, stop trying to attain all these hardcore Jack Hiles principles if you haven't got done, got down to prayer, reading your Bible, going to church, being planted, and telling people about Jesus. Put down when principle was king. Stop trying to be like Jack and start trying to be like Jesus. Be like Jesus and you can start trying to be like Jack. You're like, well, that sounds backwards. No, but Brother Hiles tried to be like Jesus. And that's where do you think all those principles came from? Those principles and ethics, they came from mastering the simple five. What are those? Let's, one more time, prayer, Bible reading, uh, a local church, um, uh, faithfulness, and witnessing. Those five. Amen. You walk out with those five tonight. Pick up on prayer tonight. 
Don't go to bed. If you haven't prayed today, don't go to bed without prayer. I don't care if you do it for three minutes. Pray tonight. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't go to God in shame. Do it tonight. Clear it tonight. Look at yourself in the face in the, in the mirror tonight and, and, and the word of God, which is the mirror, and say, let's, let's, let's get it together. Let's stop it. I'm not going to feel embarrassed anymore. I'm not letting the devil make me feel bad anymore. I, anytime I feel this way, I'm, I'm running to the throne of grace, which is found in 1 Peter 5, 7, uh, where he says, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Don't go to bed tonight without prayer if you haven't prayed today. And if you have prayed today, you can still pray again. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the principles in this word, in your word, the principles that you've laid out for us. And there are many of them, very many of them. But Lord, I, I believe that these are the essential, essential principles that we Christians, we, we have to have to be powered up, to be um, possessed by the spirit, uh, to be um, a profitable servants. We have to be prayed up. We have to be read up. And I don't mean out of tradition or out of um, um, just con out of conformity. Well, I don't, I don't want to feel guilty today, so I'm going to read and pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to grow up out of that feeling and that attitude. Help us to, if we do feel that way, to get it right. Lord, I thank you for the, the sweet fellowship we had this morning where I was able to pour out my heart to you. And I was able to confess some things before you, Lord, where I want to have a, I want to have a powerful prayer life. I want, to, I want to soak up the word of God. I want it to give me truth. I don't want to just play it. I want to be it. Lord, I, Heavenly Father, I don't want to just be on the team. I want to be an active member, a contributing member. I want to ask you tonight, is there anywhere, I want to, by a raise of hands, is there in any, any one, any one particular area that you need to improve on? Would you show me a raise of hand? I'll raise my hand. Any one area where you need to improve? Hey, you're faithful. Goodness gracious, I see faithful people. You can put your hands down. Maybe it's Bible reading. Maybe you just do the proverb a day. Maybe it's prayer time. You, you pray the Lord's prayer and get out of there. I know a big one in our country today and across countries is, or across the country is witnessing, being a real witness for Jesus, telling people about Jesus. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd help us. I, we need you. Lord, I, the altar call. Right now, you're calling people to the throne. This, this, this altar that is up here is a holy place. Not because I stand upon it, but what it represents. It's not a platform, it's an altar. It, at, at the moment the piano plays uh, during our services and people come forward, it changes from a, a platform to an altar where people come forward in humility and in... Um, in, in their humbleness to come before you and, and lay it all at the altar and say, oh, God, hear me. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, forgive me. Oh, God, I need you. And be patient with me. And Lord, these, that's what this usually represents um, on a weekly basis. But tonight, folks, but tonight, Lord, we all come to you together at the same time. And Lord, we live in a time and an age where it's live how you feel, do what you want. Lord, the world has its own principles, and they, they fluctuate, but yours don't. Yours have been rock solid since the dawn of time, the beginning of time, and the sun will never, ever set on them. Lord, help us to fasten ourselves to your principles, to live by them, and then be blessed by them. Lord, as we go out this week, to and fro and busy about like Martha, Help us not to forget to be like Mary and spend some time with you, sweet fellowship with you, knowing we're forgiven and knowing we're loved and knowing we're going to heaven. Lord, bless us on our way. 
And then, Lord, I'll pray this. Help our path. Help us to be prepared that if our path crosses the path of somebody that wants to be saved, that we're prepared to lead them. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to be aware. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.